Oh, hey, it's me again. Here to ruin your entire afternoon. I mean, come on guys, let's be real. You don't click on my videos in order to have a smiley, happy, fun time. No, you click on my videos because you desperately want to suffer. And I'm gonna make sure that happens. So throughout our entertainment-filled culture, we as a people have dealt with, at one time or another, children's shows. And I'm just gonna say children's shows and movies. I'm just gonna say just shows in the title because, you know, it just looks better. But we all watch children's shows and we always get that wonderful experience of being able to watch it when you're an adult. Like me, for example, I grew up with like Blue's Clues, The Magic School Bus, Zaboomafu, Barney, Bob the Builder, and more. But there is something very peculiar, peculiar, Peculi peculiar. But there's something unique about children's shows that no other show has. The tendency to be terrifying when it's not meant to be terrifying. Whether that be their costumes are terrifying, the animation is terrifying, or they're talking about something insanely dark and creepy that most children shouldn't be listening to. I'm gonna tear your arms out of the socket. I feel like the reason I'm so intrigued by these shows is children's minds are just a blank canvas. They're so vulnerable. And most parents kind of just shove their kids in front of a screen and they end up watching a bunch of stuff. I mean, they're at the highest form of their development and they are just watching all of these terrifying shows. And a lot of these shows, again, aren't meant to be terrifying. I mean, there's even some instance where maybe a host of a show happened to be a murderer. I don't know. But that combination of things can lead to some very dark stuff including but not limited to brainwashing your child. I mean, don't get me wrong, obviously if you stumble upon a random scary thing that your child's watching, it's not like your child is gonna all of a sudden grow up to be a, a murdering maniac, but still just watch a little bit of what your child is watching, you know, just to be safe. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you sample YouTube here and there. I mean, YouTube alone, like I, I'm gonna be talking about actual shows, like stuff on like VHSs, stuff that you you darn kids don't even know what, what they are anymore, floppy disks, but YouTube is like an entirely different video alone when it comes to the children's content. Like we all know about Elsa Gate, but children are just very easily manipulated, which is why a lot of these children's shows tend to have very bad things in them. But yes, today I want to cover the shows of our past, like the genuine shows, the ones with like high production value with a lot of money put into it. I mean, maybe not not a lot of a lot of money put into it. I mean, some of these are public access. And some of these you may recognize and you might bring up some traumatic memory and then you go into comatose and die. Like, I don't know, that might happen. I'm just warning you. I actually have been running a series on my live stream channel. Go check it out. It's Bionic Pig Live on YouTube. I stream Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But I ask my viewers to send me clips or, or videos of things that traumatized them as a child that wasn't meant to traumatize them. So this iceberg video is purely just going to be a combination of my research and a lot of stuff that you guys sent me over time. This one is not going to be based on any list I found on the internet, which I feel like most iceberg videos are. So for those who are new to iceberg type videos, it's the basic concept of the tip of the iceberg is stuff that everyone is aware of. And I go down five different tiers and the more you go down, the more obscure, more traumatizing it gets. And I just wanna mention at the beginning of the video, there isn't going to be any mention of like crimes or murdering or anything that crazy until tier five. I save tier five for all of the triggering stuff so if, if you guys don't like that stuff, don't go to tier five, trust me. And by the way, I don't want any of you losers flexing your trauma threshold. Oh, what, what? This scared you as a kid? What are you, bitch? Shut up. Yeah, I, I am. I am a bitch. Maybe I'm a pussy, shut up. Now the first tier, full of things that we all probably have heard of once or twice in our lives. Some of these struck genuine terror in the hearts of millions, whereas others loved them. And I'm just gonna throw in the obvious ones, like the ones that are supposed to be scary, which is Goosebumps, obviously. I mean, some of these episodes were kind of just laughable to say the least, you know, when it came to like the fear level, but some of the other ones were genuinely terrifying even as an adult. There was one episode I watched recently with my wife that was called Haunted Mask, and that one was quite unnerving, I would say. It really blows my mind as an adult that this is some stuff that we were allowed to watch as kids. And obviously we have episodes like 
Welcome to Camp Nightmare, The Girl Who Cried Monster, and everyone's favorite, The Night of the Living Dummy. I feel like Goosebumps was a real staple in kids' horror, you know, R.L. Stein writing all them books. It really introduced a lot of children to the horror genre, and it really showed them whether or not they're going to love it or they're just going to hate it and never look at it again. And we can't forget Tales from the Crypt Keeper, another classic one. Again, this one is supposed to be scary. I just wanted to mention them because you can't have a video like this without mentioning them. And I just want to mention that the animated Tales of the Crypt Keeper was actually for children. However, the live action version was not for children, which unfortunately a lot of kids found that out the hard way. You would be met with blood and gore and some stuff that is very uncomfortable to see. Let's move on to another legend show. Again, we have to mention these. Courage the Cowardly Dog, obviously. A show that has solidified itself in the greatest horror children's show imaginable. I mean, I refuse to hear anything different. Yeah, I mean, you can't look me in the face and tell me you didn't jump whenever that little girl playing the piano turned her face around and happened to be a claymation screaming. I hated that. I hated that. I feel like that was an underrated moment and I hated it. Or of course, the slab, we can't forget the slab. The show is chock full of trauma and it's, mm, it's beautiful. Now this next one will be the last one that is supposed to be scary, but it's again, one of those, I just kind of have to mention, Invader Zim. This one was actually a little bit too horrific for Nick that it didn't really last long, but it did accumulate a very big cult audience. And it did last long enough to cause us children a lot of trauma and gore filled nightmares. Especially the episode where, you know, Zim takes out an organ of each student in the entire school and then eats it and then becomes an organ creature. There's a lot of stuff in this show that was really messed up, but after watching it as an adult, this show was honestly comedic genius. And also the movie that was released semi-recently was amazing. All right, let's move on to the stuff that wasn't meant to be scary, that happened to be scary. Mr. Meaty. I mean, come on. Now this show I did actually kind of like when I was younger and I was wondering why it, it didn't last long. I was always like, why did this show disappear? I loved it. And then I kind of forgot about how weird and gross this show really was. I think anyone who's seen this show can all agree that the episode where they remove the tapeworm is top tier gross. I mean, I don't even really consider this show scary as much as it's just kind of gross. Like there was one episode where they accidentally put their hand in a fryer and uh, they ended up eating their own hands because it tasted good and he was trying to attract a girl. So how he attracted a girl was frying his hand and eating it. Honestly, it really makes you scratch your head at what the hell they were thinking with this show. Next, of course, we have the Teletubbies. I mean, come on, you really think I'm gonna make a video about terrifying children shows without mentioning Teletubbies? I mean, where to even begin with this abomination of a show? It was just hell incarnate. Nothing really made sense in this show. It was kind of just like sensory. Everything that was senses, the bright colors, loud noises, boing sounds everywhere. And we can't forget the cum. Oh, what, you forgot about the cum? Come on, guys, you can't forget about the cum. I mean, seriously, what the hell is that goo shit? It has to be Teletubby cum. And the fact that it literally makes like a shitting sound every single time that goo comes a just ugh. What, what are you supposed to do with that? Not to mention that creepy baby in the sun. And above all anything, this show was just ominous. Like the ominous speaker gods that come out of the ground and like announce everything that the Teletubbies do and the Teletubbies do it. No matter what ridiculous request they have, they do it. Showing our children that they must obey. They must obey our overlords. Okay, it might be a little bit far-fetched of a theory. Oh, oh God, kill it. Kill this spawn of hell with a silver bullet, wooden stake, something. Oh, Jesus Christ. So this is cum guzzler. That's just what I'm coining this thing because it guzzles cum. That's literally what they do. When they come on the walls, it guzzles it. It, it, it sucks it right up. The fuck am I supposed to call this? What is that thing? What, what is that? There's always been a weird thing about children's shows and gooey, slimy things. I mean, just look at Nickelodeon and their slime, and we all know how Nickelodeon is. I mean, just watch my last Iceberg video if you haven't figured it out. But Teletubbies has obviously just become infamous in the entire internet realm. With a bunch of creepy pastas and crazy theories, like, it, it's just nightmare fuel. Solidifying its role as one of the most recognizable kids shows that was actually terrifying.
So since we mentioned Teletubbies, we gotta mention its cousin, which I actually didn't know that this was even a thing until recently. It's called Booba. Yeah, Booba, like, like Booba, like why did it, I don't know. But basically Booba is just Teletubbies on LSD. It's just a bunch of uncircumcised penises doing little dances and making fart sounds. <laughs> That's literally what the show is. Again, I would just call these sensory videos. There isn't really any rhyme or reason of what's going on. It's just fart noise, giggly sounds, sparkles, colors everywhere. There's not really much talking in the show. Now, I'm sure if you're like a three month old baby and don't really understand the complexities of our corrupt government, you obviously would think this is great. But the thing is, I'm not a stupid three month old dumb baby. Yeah, I'm smart and this shit's scary. Oh yeah, they also open portals to different dimensions and make innocent children do their bidding. Moving on. Okay, let's move down the shaft a little bit to move on to tier two. Tiny Planets Bing Bong. Bing Bong. What are these titles, man? What are these titles? Now this one could just be me. Maybe, maybe I'm just the weirdo here, but oh my God, I hated this. Honestly, I'm realizing a lot of these are British shows. That explains a lot. Bing and Bong meet up with unique space creatures in their quest to help the tiny planet universe. The only voice we hear from in this entire show is from Haley, and this is quoted the all-knowing young female, you must be God. But she's always on the lookout for ways Bing and Bong can help the inhabitants of the tiny planet universe. The fact that the description of the show literally calls the woman an all-knowing female just makes it more ominous. After thinking about a lot of these shows, there's a lot of like adult voiceovers that kind of just tell people what to do throughout the show. I don't know, there's probably some weird cryptic theory we could throw in here easily. Like it's brainwashing our children in order to stay in line and take orders from adults. Wait a second. That's exactly what it's doing. But the show itself is fine. I mean, literally just white cum monsters, especially the smaller one with a gaping mouth of hell. Speaking of nightmares, let's talk about another kind of popular hellscape show. Now this one, I'm not just going to label the one show. I'm just going to say, um, Put a face on a vehicle show. But we're obviously gonna start with Thomas the Tank Engine here. The show we all know and love. Well, love is kind of a strong word. The interesting thing about this show is the fact that it actually was kind of dark looking back. And I don't really think many people realize this. You know, it follows the classic children's show style formula where every single episode there's like a problem and then they fix it and there's some sort of lesson or moral in the story. But some of these morals were a little bit skewed. With insanely aggressive punishments and authoritarian rules and borderline slavery, <laughs> which I know they're just trains, but you gotta realize the kids, they don't make that connection. They, they think they're real, man. They basically would consider them human. But in one episode, for example, how they punish a train is to lock them in a shed indefinitely with no tracks to go anywhere as time moves on and mother nature gradually just grows on top of it, literally getting buried alive. A good lesson for all children to know. And we can't forget another episode where a train did not want to work in the rain and the normal response to this was to lock him in a brick prison for all eternity. Basically the train version of purgatory as you know, you aren't really dead and you aren't really alive. Remember kids, if you don't listen to your parents, they're getting sent to purgatory. You're getting buried alive. But there is another show that I kind of forgot about. Uh, I don't know if many people remember this, but it's called JJ the Jet Plane. Now, sure, Thomas the Tank Engine has a lot of creepy faces in it, but no one comes close to the characters in JJ. We got old Oscar Revan Evan Tuffy, who, wait a second, got an Asian face. Buck teeth, speech impediment. I don't remember this. Did we forget? JJ, what other dark secrets do you hold? Uh, so yeah, after seeing the blatant racial stereotype, I looked up some more information about it. Turns out not only was there Tuffy, who was just a giant stereotype, but apparently Herky was an Indian stereotype and Tracy was an Italian racial stereotype. But I mean, let's be honest, those two don't even come close to what, what, why? Why do they do that to you, Tuffy? What the hell is this shit? They had no chill back then, oh my God. Now let's talk about one that I feel like a lot of people might know, and the only reason I say this is because I get recommended to review this all the time, The Secret of Nim. And yes, this will be a potential review in the future. Now I feel like a lot of stuff in this movie you would consider to be scary, but I feel like one scene that really stuck out for a lot of people, including me, was the great owl scene. Now personally, I find this scene to be kind of masterfully done as it just 
makes me want to review this movie even more. What I would compare this to is like a main character going into the dragon's lair. Mrs. Briggs becomes in seek of help for her child and as she's beckoned into the house of the great owl, a spider crawls up only to be smushed in a very grotesque way by the great owl. I feel like this introduction alone to the character is enough to give a child nightmares. However, seeing it now as an adult, it's just, I can't help but love this scene. And while we're on the topic of old scary movies, let's talk about one that was not made for children. However, a lot of children saw it, assuming it was going to be made for children. Now, this is going to be a special case. I know it's supposed to be only children's shows, but this is different. So we all have heard that classic stereotype of animation. You know, a lot of people assume, oh, it's animated, must be for children. And that really rang true in the 70s and 80s. As Watership Down was a lot of children's first traumatic experience. Now, for those who do not know what Watership Down is, I'll just say, um, not a children's movie, to say the least. However, I could see how it'd be very misleading. But the movie is based on a novel and it follows a colony of young rabbits as they are in search of a new home after a young rabbit predicts something terrible coming. And this movie is chock full of gore, death, and just nature at its finest. And I could completely see a parent slipping up and making this mistake as you're looking for a movie for your kid to watch. You see a nice little movie with, with a picture on the front of two cute little bunnies, you know, hanging out and it's called Watership Down. Aw, a nice little heartfelt movie for kids. Am I right, Shadow? Yeah. So they rent that bad boy and pop it into the floppy disk cassette holder and walk away as her child experiences the worst horror any human has ever experienced. Let me just do a quick roll of some terrifying frames of this movie along with some happy royalty free music, shall we? Time to move even deeper down the shaft to level three. Now, this is a movie I wasn't aware of until recently when someone brought it to my attention on stream. This is the movie called The Adventures of Mark Twain. Now, apparently a lot of people have watched this movie in school and there's a specific scene in the movie that deals with very, very dark topics and the depressing reality of mortality. Basically, the premise of the show stems from Haley's Comet. Apparently, when Mark Twain was born, Haley's Comet was visible. And also when Mark Twain died, Haley's Comet was visible. You know, that's that's cool because it only happens every 75 years. So it was based on that whole concept. Yeah, it was. The premise of the movie is that Twain has built an elaborate high-tech spacefaring Zeppelin in order to drift into the heavens and find Haley's Comet in person. And there's a scene in the movie where they meet Satan. I mean, that's at least what he calls himself. And Satan is also known as the Mysterious Stranger as it is based off of a little novel that was titled The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. And Satan, as he does, basically shows the main cast a slew of horrific scenes. He hands them clay and asks them to make people out of it. And then he brings life to those people and shows them making a kingdom of sorts. And what starts is like a happy-go-lucky race of clay people turns into kind of just human nature a display of greed, power, and everything bad that humanity has to offer. And in the end, he displays an earthquake that kills off all of the clay creations in a very, very horrific way. And as the children walk through the door, he's left in the void and leaves with some ominous words. He tells them that life itself is only a vision, nothing but a dream as he fades into the void. Some really cryptic shit for a child, I would think. That with the combination of claymation and witnessing these humanoid clay beings getting ruthlessly murdered. Yeah, it's top tier trauma, I'd say. Next, we have Pipkins, a show that again, is not meant to be terrifying, but holy hell it is. I don't understand how anyone believed that these abominations could be considered puppets. They more look like they were made with human skin in the hair of some animal, or maybe they're just roadkill that they stuffed. The premise of the show is innocent enough, but dear lord, the designs of the puppets are something out of a horror movie, especially this monkey, and importantly, Hartley Hare. Now, the reason I'm mentioning Hartley Hare is not only the fact that, you know, he looks like a, a rabbit that got ran over, but he has a weird fascination with his hand puppet. And also, there's this little segment where he talks to children about being naughty through his glove puppet. You can be naughty with a glove puppet. And in this segment, he tells kids that you can do all sorts of naughty things with a glove puppet 
Now that statement alone is a little bit problematic in many different ways. I mean, it's an interesting thought how some of this stuff as children didn't even phase us. Like we looked at it, <laughs> it's a puppet. And then in reality, it's just some abomination. Next, we have the infamous Peppermint Park. Nice little ring, nice little title, huh? And this one you may never have heard of, and that's just because it was a direct-to-video children's show. So unless your parents picked up a copy of this, unfortunately, you might have missed a little bit of stuff that would have scarred you for life. Consisting of six volumes released in 1987, the show is a mixture of live action, animation, and of course, puppets. I don't know what it is about the whole puppet show thing, but man, they always make me feel uncomfortable. No joke, the funny thing about this, if you look at the designs of these puppets, they were actually used as inspiration for people who specialize in horror. There's a show called Channel Zero that actually used the likeness of these characters as inspiration for an episode where they used puppets as like a horror element. And another reason why this show is so uncanny is sometimes they use the heads of puppets, but they use the body in the hands of humans. Why would you do that? Especially in the letter M song, which has become kind of like the popular thing of this show because it's just terrifying. I mean, we could pretty much chalk this show up to just a fear inducing copy of Sesame Street. Now let's move on to another kid's movie actually called Dark Crystal. Now this one is another one that a lot of people have requested for me to review. It has a lot of very creepy elements to it, and I think it mainly has to do with the fact that everything is practical effects, everything is puppeteering. Again, it, a lot of it is puppets. However, even without the terrifying character designs, there is a horrific scene in this movie that I don't understand how any parent would allow a child to watch this, draining the essence of their life scene. I think there's multiple, but this one is the worst. And there are a few scenes of this happening, but one of the more horrific ones is where they drain a pod. The basic concept of this is they are draining the life essence of these little podlings in order for them to attain eternal life. And the process of that is quite terrifying to say the least. I mean, it, they're draining their life essence. So you can kind of guess what it's gonna be like. You witness an already terrifying looking puppet become a even more terrifying looking puppet. And I feel like the scene is even scarier because as the life is getting sucked out, of this little podling creature. Right next to that podling is another one who is just witnessing it happening to this one and they're like, oh shit, this is gonna happen to me as well. I feel like it's a little detail that not many people notice and it's terrifying. I feel like there's a lot of things that I can mention about this movie in this video, but I'm just gonna save that one scene for this one here. Next on the list is something I actually witnessed as a child, Emmett Freedy. Now, I don't even remember how I remember this, but it's probably one of those memories that I locked in the back of my mind for a long time, hoping I would never have to relive it, but unfortunately I am. This is some of the most grotesque looking claymation characters I've ever seen. Now, obviously as an adult, I would think, oh, a cool style. But the thing is, is this was heavily oriented towards children. Not even Henry Selleck or Tim Burton could come up with designs like this. Like this is some scary ass shit. But this is actually featured on a sketch comedy show on Nickelodeon that was called Kablam. I mean, I'm not sure if many of you remember that, but I do. Follows a large tooth Emmett, who after dropping a piece of cereal in his hair, he is sent home by the nurse for suspicion of lice. And what proceeds is a giant angry riot over the fact that he has lice in his hair. And they basically try to kill him and say they, you know, want him dead. I believe it's supposed to be somewhat of like a cautionary tale, like don't lie, because the whole premise of it is he had a piece of cereal in his hair that looked like lice. So we got out of being at school by lying and saying it's lies so he didn't have to do his homework but kids you better do your homework or you might have an angry mob chase you down and try to kill you but i don't remember anyone ever mentioning this it honestly felt like a fever dream because it felt like i was the only one who've seen it but let me know in the comments below did you see this are you with me you terrified now this next one, I I don't even I don't even know what you call this. It's sort of a children's show. I mean, it was off of a children's show, kind of, and then it's weird. 
Mr. Blobby is a character from the deepest layer of the Upside Down that not only looks creepy, but they use a voice changer. I don't know if like the person inside is the one who's mic'd up with a voice changer or they overdub it or not. But the problem with the voice, obviously the character design is absolutely terrifying, like in general. But the fact that the pitch at which they voice change this person is pitched to a fourth, which for anyone who knows anything about music theory is considered the devil's interval, which is used throughout time as the scariest tone you can make. You know, it's like a perfect fourth. It just has that creepy dissonant sound that everyone hates. And for some reason they thought, hey, let's throw that on a children's character. <laughs> And all this character really does is just destroy. He's kind of the epitome of chaos. He walks into an area and just destroys stuff. There's no rhyme or reason for what he does. He just kind of does it. He lives life on the edge, no rules. He originally was created on a show called Noel's House Party, where the entire purpose of this character was just kind of like jump in and just disrupt his show. It was actually the least favorite character of the show. Everyone kind of hated him because he was scary and was supposed to be for kids, but kids hated him, but they just kept going with it. Yeah, Mr. Blobby's up there. I hate that thing. Okay, baby, now let's move on to tier four, the second to last tier. The shit's gonna start getting creepy. Mr. Nosy Bonk. That sounds like a great name for a children's character. Now, when you picture someone named Mr. Nosy Bonk, like, you know, you might think of like a clown looking character. Just, you know, just a character with like a funny face, big nose. However, it's more of a creature who broke out of SCP containment and is running amok in our streets and needs to be annihilated immediately. This character has lived in infamy with creepypasta made up about him as you could literally put this character as a villain in any horror movie and the movie would be great. And the funny part about this, and it's kind of ironic, is that the show's title was called Jigsaw. Maybe, you know, maybe Jigsaw's mask was inspired by, okay, that might be a little bit of a stretch, but he's scary. But basically his whole character was just a British puzzle solver. I'm starting to realize a lot of these shows are British. Seriously, what's wrong with you guys? But this show ran for six seasons and I genuinely don't understand how. I mean, sure, I guess Mr. Nosy Bonk was just a like little pin in the entire show, but like imagine looking out your window and just seeing someone wearing a Mr. Nosy Bonk face mask. Like you would be shitting bricks. But let's talk about something everyone loves. The Bible, right? Now, even people who are religious can agree that religious children's shows, they tend to be creepy. I mean, let's come on, let's be honest. And Pea Salty is at the top of that list. Pea Salty is some sort of human Bible creature with cheek prosthetics to make himself look ironically like the spawn of Satan. Throughout the show, he, you know, sings songs about Jesus, how we love Jesus and God. And occasionally when there's like a laugh track, when there's a portion of the show you're supposed to be laughing, they like jump scare you with the screen of a bunch of mouths moving and loud laughing. I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, Pea Salty, he's kind of a creepy guy. You know, a dude looks like a book where he got big cheeks. He's weird. However, you haven't met his companion yet, have you? Meet Blooper, a grown man wearing a dog costume. Now I know everyone's going to judge. Oh, furry, furry, furry. Come on, guys. Not going to lie. This would even be a disrespect to furries. And the reason this is creepy is obviously, you know, the costume is just terrifying because he's using face makeup to look like a dog, but like a, a jumper suit for the rest. But second of all, the kids are walking around petting this grown, probably 40, 50 year old man on all fours, just petting him like a doggy. They're riding on top of this grown man like a doggy. But not only that, but this dude was like laying next to some kids while they're sleeping as a doggy. There are so many things wrong with this character. There's even a point in the show where like he shoves his ass in other kids because, you know, he's on the ground and the kid's short and his ass is like in their fit. It's weird. Genuinely don't understand who thought that this was a good idea. It's freaking weird. Next, we have, I'm going to give a shot at this. Ratafak Plat. Placha, Rata Flak Placha. Did I, did I nail it? Probably not. Now, the only way to describe this, sleep paralysis demon. Rata Flak Placha is a puppet that appears as a human with peach skin. It's 
It's got like messy, thin white hair, blue eyes, red lips, light yellow buck teeth, large round cheeks, and a very long neck and a large nose. I would only compare this to an old woman who only has bones left. And you know, the seven foot tall and four leg situation. Yeah. Kids are gonna love this. But the way that this works is there's actually two people underneath the blanket that are puppeteering this abomination. Out of everything I've seen in my research of this, this probably takes the cake as the creepiest design. Now the character itself isn't really necessarily that bad. You know, he's just like a goofy, happy-go-lucky character that gets himself into some shenanigans and stuff. And apparently after this show was canceled, some dudes actually found the puppet in a dumpster and made multiple videos using the character. Some of them funny and some of them a little bit disturbing, but still to this day, I will never understand how something so terrifying would ever be considered a children's character. Those of you who witnessed this as a child, how did you turn out? Are you okay? Next, we have the revolting slob from Crash Box. Now, this was a character that was used as a vocabulary game. The slob does something, and then the kids have to like guess what word was he doing exactly. Like one example was uh, this creature was blowing a kiss to the lady who was talking. All those kissing sounds mean you're flirting with me. And the announcer was feeling very uncomfortable, which I just am confused why in like a toddler type show, they're showing a grown disgusting man blowing a kiss to a woman and then the woman being like, uh, all right. And also the word that they had to guess was flirting because the grotesque thing was flirting with the announcer. And the thing that's hilarious about this, I mean, a lot of people find it hilarious as a child, you'd probably get scared or really concerned about this because you are witnessing a character that you are watching explode. Yes, they literally explode this character. Because on this episode, for example, she defines an incorrect word and says what it is as some sense of like disappearing or going away. And then it happens to this character. And in this one, the word was decimating. And you guessed it, he got decimated. Okay, it's time. Final tier. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all the stuff that has triggering things, crimes, murders, etc. So if you don't like that type of stuff and you just want the kind of like fun, happy-go-lucky stuff, you, you, I mean, you can leave. But if, if you want to keep going, let's keep going. It's tier five. It's time to bring out Shadow, right? You ready for this shit? So the first one is literally just a blatant pedophile on live television and no one does anything about it. I mean, I guess it was the 80s, but uh, this shit is something else. The show was called Like Mom. It was a Canadian TV show originally hosted by a man named Stephen Young. And then later on after season one, the hosts were changed to a husband-wife duo. It was Fergie Oliver was the husband and Catherine Swing was the wife. The format was to determine which child and mother knew each other best through an answer matching as well as a bake-off challenge stuff. There were three teams consisting of a young child and his or her mother, and they competed on each episode. Seems like an innocent enough show, am I right, guys? However, there was kind of a little bit of a problem with Fergie Oliver. See, he had this weird tendency where um, uh, he wanted to uh, kiss the little girls. And no, I'm not talking, you know, a little kiss on the hand, a little peck on the cheek. I'm talking forced kiss on the mouth on live television. And when I say forced, I'm talking about almost every single child backed away and then he coaxed them. There's one very popular clip uh, where he compliments how pretty an 11 year old girl is and then proceeds to force a kiss. And when I say force a kiss, I mean he legitimately pushes his face onto her and quote unquote, steals a kiss from her. And after he kisses her, he talks to her about, is she going to get married when she's older? Do you talk about getting married and having a family and things like that? <laughs> and then proceeds to ask her, what do 11 year olds do when they go on a date? That is the most uncomfortable combination of events I've ever seen in my life. Not only that, but whenever the host kisses the contestant, he's met with woos and cheers from the crowd. The crowd is literally cheering him on whenever he does it. I mean, I'm absolutely amazed how not a single parent got upset about this. Well, I mean, maybe they're just wanting their 15 seconds of fame and don't really care how they get it. The thing that makes this so terrible is the fact that not only is a child getting sexually assaulted, but they are getting sexually assaulted on live television in front of thousands, maybe millions of people. I can't express how traumatizing this would be as a child. There is even instances where the host tells the child the only way they're going to win the game is if they give him a kiss. Can't have a hug and a kiss? Uh-uh. 
Well, I guess you can't win the show then. There is just so much footage of uncomfortable children backing away from this grown man forcing his face onto their face. It's just so hard to watch. There's even a line in the show where he states that the mothers are always so easy to kiss, but he says the kids are really hard. The mothers are always so easy to kiss, it's the kids. How, I ask you, did this show run for five years? I know, I know a lot of you are like, oh yeah, this guy's probably locked up by now, you know? Like, you literally have live evidence of him kissing children. Well, no. Yeah, no, he never got charged with anything. You see, in Canada, apparently in the 80s, this heinous act was not illegal. So, no charges were ever pressed. He's still chilling today just fine. Stuff like this really makes you question humanity, doesn't it? Next one is Tomorrow's Pioneers Brainwashing Show. Now, you guys may have seen a video going around in the internet of like a Mickey Mouse copycat doing ridiculous things, and it is that show. But behind this happy-go-lucky mouse is uh, something very, very sinister. And I just wanna mention this has to do with war and a lot of politics. I'm not gonna get into it. I literally know nothing about the country that we're gonna be talking about here. So I'm not gonna say whether or not they were verified in their opinions of doing this. However, in a basic moral sense, this show did teach children to uh, hate people who they were at war with and taught them to basically want to go to war and want to fight. So in a moral sense, this show is very terrible. I know nothing about the politics of it. But the main character is Farfor, who is just a blatant Mickey Mouse ripoff. But this character says things like, uh, we will restore this nation to its glory. We will liberate with Allah's will and we will liberate the Muslim countries invaded by murderers. This show was a basically Barney or Sesame Street for this country. There were probably two-year-olds watching this. They also mentioned the killing and slaughtering of women and children from the war, which I'm just gonna say it, not really something that I would really think children would be interested in seeing or hearing about. There's even parts in the show where they name drop leaders of other countries, including George Bush stating that they will defeat the enemy and never surrender. And the list goes on and on about war, fighting for your country. And one of the very infamous episodes of this is Far Four and the AK-47. Yes, that is the title of the episode. Where an eight-year-old child who plays as kind of like the co-star in a Far Four sings a little song about war once again. And in this song, one of the lyrics are, it is the time of death, we will fight the war, and the answer is an AK-47. Yeah, children love AK-47. That's like the first thing I think of when I think of a child. Let's give them an AK-47. Yes, yeah, subtexts are for noobs! And we even have little bits of hate on Jewish people as well. It really is just a mixed bag of just awful. Now there is a lot of details that go into this show, a lot of layers that have to do with this. And it's really hard to cover this on a little section of an iceberg video. So I'll lead you to a YouTuber named Nick Crowley. Uh, he recently released a video actually talking about this topic in length. Like I'm talking an hour and 40 minutes in length. So if you guys are interested in how deep this show really goes, I highly recommend going to check out his video because it talks about it in insane detail. The so last but definitely not least, we have Joy Junction. Now, right out the gate, see the puppet? See the doll? Scary, right? You know the doll, scary face? Kind of reminds you of the Goosebumps episode, right? See, the creepy puppet he's using, while I will agree it is terrifying, is actually not what this part is about. It's actually not the puppet. It's actually the puppeteer or should I say ventriloquist. Ronald William Brown was the ventriloquist from Joy Junction, a show on the Christian television network. This man is apparently someone who took children to church, someone who held multiple pizza parties, actually weekly at his trailer home with a bunch of children. How it all started was all of a sudden, there was boys underwear found at his house. And yes, obviously pretty suspicious, but they instantly kind of just let him off. And the reason for that is he stated that those were underwear for his puppets. So they, they're they kind of like, oh, this is a trusted guy in the Christian community. Everyone seems to like him and trust him. We'll let him off, you know? But as time went on, they started to realize how bad this actually was. After the search of his house, they found multiple pictures of CP in his house, but this was no normal case of CP. These pictures were not just of children. There were actually pictures of toddlers with clothes wrapped around their heads and mouths gagged. One of these pictures was actually a boy around one, maybe two years old, in a roasting pan displayed in an oven. 
And there is also multiple other pictures of children in a roasting pan. I don't know if you guys are starting to realize, but this man actually had a weird obsession with eating children. And just to show you how completely ingrained and trustworthy he was amongst the community, one of the family members of one of the children who allegedly had their nude picture taken said that he did not do anything wrong and took the pictures because they were funny. <laughs> what? This mother, I assume, was the mother of probably one of the one or two year old boys. I mean, I guess nude photos of like a literal baby. Obviously, in, in you wouldn't expect anything negative out of that, right? Well, safe to say she was very, very wrong. After further searching, authorities allege that they actually found pictures of decapitated children that had been bound and cooked on his computer. And the real kicker in this case, and the thing that really pushed him to get arrested, was the conversations that were found on his computer. Apparently, he was in this like forum or group chat of a bunch of dudes who just loved the idea of eating children. Some of them actually did eat children. These conversations were between him, a man named Michael Arnett, and a man in Florida. These conversations are very hard to listen to, so be warned. I'm not going to list the entirety of it uh, because some of it I just, I don't care to read, but I'm just gonna read some of it. They constantly did refer to children uh, as piglets instead of children, some sort of like livestock. And one of the chat rooms, Arnett asked how the child was doing, and in response, Brown said, Sadly, he is doing well. I wish I had him tied and gagged in the closet. Now, Brown is of course referring to his target child who he's been planning on uh, kidnapping, killing, and eating. And in response, Arnett says he would make a fine Easter feast. And they go into great detail as how they would cook them, how they would eat them, how they would serve them up. Brown even asked Arnett on tips of how to quickly kidnap and murder a child so he can have a feast. And apparently this chat room held around 42 others who discussed all of these disgusting crimes, some of which actually happened as some people on these chat forums have actually killed and eaten children. But it is a good thing that Robert was caught before, you know, he ended up following through with this. He ended up being sentenced to 20 years in jail in 2013. Not long enough of a sentence, if you ask me. Now there are a lot of children shows out there and really it's just become a worry of who do you trust? Because as we've seen with some of the abuse of say child actors and other things like that, you start to realize that adults who want children or have an obsession with children or an attraction to children, they tend to find work that involve children. So it's really hard to trust anyone who is an adult on a children's show. It's really hard to trust anyone who works with a bunch of children. But there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, that is the iceberg of disturbing children's shows, movies, etc. I hope you liked the video. If you do, you know what to do. You've been on YouTube long enough. I don't have to spoon feed you what to do in order to, to, to like the video. I just told you what to do. You, you'll figure it out, all right? You've done it before, okay? You got anything to say, Shadow? Got anything to say before we go? Huh? No? No, he's got nothing. Bye.